I didn't know my bad. You know, we tried to be on good terms today. We could get pretty good with it. We could get
bless the Lord this morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, it's a good Friday here in the house of the Lord. I mean, it's it's a good Friday because our Savior did something that none of us could have done for ourselves. So come on and put your hands together and glorify the Lord for what he has done for all of us in this place today. We welcome you out to service. So glad that you are here. Let us get into a word of prayer before we move too much further into this service. God, we love you and thank you for the blessing of another day's journey, even for the blessing of a good Friday service, God, the seven last words uttered from the cross. Lord, we're thankful, God, that you blessed us to be here this year. God, for this is the day that you have made, and we're rejoicing in it. And even on today, Lord, where we will be preaching about the anguish, the pain, the separation, the loss, the hurt, all that our Savior went through for us, God, we're thankful for it because we know it leads to a powerful resurrection on Easter morning, on Resurrection Sunday. And so, God, we give you glory this morning, God, for what you're going to do in this space. Lord, we're praying that you'll touch every heart, mind, and soul. Allow us to be receptive to the preaching of the good news of the gospel. Allow us, God, to be taken deeper into our understanding of what it meant for you to atone for our sins on the cross of glory. And bless us, God, to be empowered to leave this place to know that, God, if you went through suffering on our behalf, God, this world, there's nothing it can give us that we cannot overcome. There's no pain that we cannot rise above. There's no hurt that we cannot recover from, God, because you did it, we can do it. God, and so we thank you, Lord, for what you did for us on the cross. So, God, now now speak to us from the cross of Calvary, God. Let us be inspired by the words of your suffering, but even God redeemed, knowing, Lord God, that even though weeping may endure for a night, joy is coming in the morning. God, so bless us today and speak to this house. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and God's people together said amen. Praise God. You may be seated in the presence of an awesome God. Just a few things up top before we get moving in the service, because once we get moving, we're going to be moving. Somebody say amen. This is rush out hour to Calvary. Amen. Amen. And we mean that hour almost literally. Praise the Lord. So our preachers will be prepared to give you from their heart what God blessed them to utter on today. And we know that we shall be blessed. And so we're grateful again to invite you or rather to welcome you to this good morning. Uh, a good morning to you from this rush hour of Calvary. The often imitated but never duplicated original rush, seven last words from the cross here from Pennsylvania Avenue AME Zion Church. Want you to know that after service there will be at light refreshments and a continental breakfast prepared for you as you go on your way to perhaps other services throughout this wonderful Good Friday. Got a lot of great churches, a lot of good preaching today. And so hopefully this is your first stop on one of perhaps several others. Nevertheless, we're grateful that you are here. Want to very quickly acknowledge any clergy that are in the house. If you are here, please stand to your feet that we might see and celebrate you on today. Wonderful. Good to see you. Wonderful women of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. I think we got Bishop I know we have Bishop Harvin was over here. He was over there. There he is. There he is. God bless you. Good to see you, Bishop, and glad that you are here as well. Amen. And so you see here this morning uh, from the flyer, this is Rush Hour to Calvary. We're celebrating and lifting up the Sons of Thunder. That's our theme today. So you got some younger-ish preachers here today who are going to bless us, amen, with powerful words, some movers and shakers, prophets here in the city of Baltimore and even surrounding areas areas, folks connected to this ministry, amen, and others as well again who are doing great things in our city. So uh, we want you to get prepared to say a lot of amens and worship with us this morning to celebrate the word of God being proclaimed in a wonderful way, amen, to the glory of God. And so we will be uh, having with us, the first word will be offered by Reverend Dr. Reginald J. Chandler of the Freedom Temple AME Zion Church. Come on, give God praise for him. Following Dr. Chandler will be Reverend Melek E. M. Thomas from the Payne Memorial AME Church. Come on and give God praise for him. Following Reverend Thomas will be Reverend Brandon M. Height from Emmaus Missionary Baptist Church. Come on and say amen. Then we'll have Reverend Dr. Jason O. Jordan Griffin from the Union Memorial United Methodist Church. Come on and say amen for that. Following that, we're going to stop for a brief offering. Uh, and then right after that offering, we're going to come back and hear from Dr. Reverend Dr. Jonathan D. Counts of the Spotswood AME Zion Church right out of Penn Ave AME Zion Church church but now in New Britain Connecticut then we will have Reverend Dale Dennis the second of the Solid Rock Church somebody say amen and then to, uh, to uh, round us out will be Reverend Michael A. Parker the second from Journey United Methodist Church somebody say amen so put on your seat belt because these brothers are going to take us
us to another level amen as it relates to the glory of God amen amen so we will hear a brief selection from our choir and following that selection amen Dr. Chandler will mount the pulpit and preach the word of God somebody say amen, amen. come on let's put our hands together come on Grace and peace unto you, my brothers and my sisters. Good morning. It's truly good to be here. I'm going to ask that you would be kind enough to share with me from the word of God from the book of Luke, chapter number 23, and looking at verse number 34, I'm really reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. It says, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. I want to speak to you from the thought, Father, forgive them. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this time. Let me decrease that you may increase. Hide me behind the cross so they will see less of me, but more of thee. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Somebody ought to say amen. 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 Touch your neighbor and say, Father, please forgive me. We need to ask for forgiveness. And we are grateful that on the cross, Jesus made the declarative statement, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And as I started to unpack this passage of scripture, I had to go back to the upper room. There's a lot to cover, but can we go back to the upper room where Jesus was uh, there with his disciples and having a meal and at the table was Peter who would in a few moments lie and say that he did not know Jesus. At the table, we would see James and John who were more concerned about prestige and promise rather than uh, uh, the things of God. Uh, at the table was Judas Iscariot, uh, uh, the money bag holder, the treasurer, the one who would sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. At 
the table there were a ragtag group of individuals but yet the Lord still served them communion yet the Lord still got up from the table and took off his garment got onto his knees got into a lower position to serve them and to wash their feet uh, I'm kind of reminded of what the Reverend Dr. Lewis M. Anthony said uh, that your test of maturity is when you can wash the feet of your assassin uh, do I got a witness in the house uh, yeah yeah Jesus uh, is saying father forgive them for they know not what they do uh, because just after the upper room experience now we see Jesus going in to the garden of Gethsemane where he says not my will but thy will be done he asked his boys he asked the disciples can you stay up just a little while longer can you keep watch and the Negroes fell asleep oh my gosh they wasn't concerned about what the Lord was getting ready to do and yet the Lord still pursued the will of God you know why because it wasn't about him but it was about the kingdom can I park right here when we make ministry about us then the church won't get blessed the people won't get blessed but the moment you follow the will of God something is going to happen chains will be broken lives will be touched healing will go forth do I got a witness somebody say yeah somebody say yeah can I go to my text because I only got three more minutes here's the bottom line when Jesus is on the cross and he says father forgive them for they know not what they do guess what I asked the question unto the Lord who is the them were you talking about Peter were you talking about Judas were you talking about James and John who were the them were you talking about the Roman centurions were you talking about the Pharisees were you talking about the women who were the them were you talking about the Roman guard who was it who was it and then I heard the Lord say to me Chandler it's you that I'm talking about you looking at the wrong people you're looking at the wrong crowd you got to look at yourself I'm talking about anybody else but I'm talking about you is there anybody here who just simply want to say thank you Lord for talking about me thank you Lord for forgiving me of my wretched self of my debilitated mind of my fickle ways I wish I had a witness who don't mind shaming the devil and telling the Lord thank you thank you for your goodness thank you for your faithfulness thank you for your love thank you for your goodness say yeah watch this now watch this and I'm through I'm through I got to share with you a conversation between a priest and a prophetess uh, uh, it's a catholic priest and he said uh, uh, I don't believe uh, that the prophetess knows what she's talking about uh, and he says to her madam would you kindly tell me what I did when I was in seminary school and the prophetess said well uh, let me get back to you in a, just a couple of days uh, because I got to go in prayer the Catholic priest says uh, she don't know what she's talking about uh, I don't believe in what she says uh, she's not going to work uh, and just a few days later the priest goes over to the Catholic to the prophetess and he says madam uh, did you talk with the Lord uh, she said mm -hmm, I did uh, he said well uh, did you have conversation with him uh, uh, she said mm -hmm, Mm -hmm, I did uh, and uh, he said madam uh, I need to know uh, if God spoke to you uh, because I want to know if you're real uh, he said madam uh, what did I do uh, when I was in seminary school uh, and she says well uh, Mr. Catholic priest uh, I did have a conversation with the Lord uh, and we had uh, a conversation uh, for many hours uh, and the Lord 
Lord has given me a word for you. Now the priest is at the edge of his seat and he says, well, what did he say? She said, do you really want to know? He said, yeah, I want to know. What did he say? She said, do you really want to know? He said, yes, come on now and give me the word. She said, sir, I'm going to tell you what the Lord told me when I asked him, what did you do in seminary? What did you say in seminary? Where did you go in seminary? That's when the priest said, you better spit it out or I'm going to go crazy on you. She said, sir, I got some news for you. When I asked what the Lord said, he told me to tell you, I don't remember. I don't remember because I forgot because the moment you asked for forgiveness, I gave it to you. You better shout God and say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your forgiveness.
God as we find ourselves in various places in life where we feel far from you. Let this be a reminder to us that you're an omnipresent God and that no matter where we find ourselves, we are always near the cross. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Third word from the cross. Gospel. Second. Ooh, Jesus. Okay. Y'all, y'all pray. Y'all pray. Y'all pray for me. Amen. I got three services to do today. So y'all. <laughs> y'all pray. Gospel, according to Luke, chapter 23, verse 39 through 43. Excuse me, I, I, I thought I had a little bit more time. thought I was going to carry on with that um, near the cross. Give me a quick second, but I promise I'm going to get out your way. Then one of the criminals, then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God? seeing you are under the same condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we received the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Grass may wither, the flower may fade, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. Amen. Amen. I'd like to preach from this text, this thought, something torn and new. Something torn and new. When I was younger, before there was a Nintendo Switch or uh, a Game Boy Color, there was a toy that I played with called an Etch-A-Sketch. And on that Etch-A-Sketch, you used to be, okay, I guess some of y'all did stuff other than come to church on Saturday. Amen. So I had an Etch-A-Sketch. And what that Etch-A-Sketch would do is that I would have the ability to draw and design whatever I wanted to draw and design uh, and, and do it just by moving these different knobs on the side. And I would just direct the things the way that I would want them to go. But the thing with an Etch-A-Sketch is that anytime somebody shook it, the entire picture gets removed from the Etch-A-Sketch. And so one day I was uh, in the family room, our family was in there, and I was playing with my Etch-A-Sketch. My dad is in there, my mom, and everybody's in there. My siblings are in there. And one of my older brothers, trying to be funny, comes over to me while I'm drawing a house on my Etch-A-Sketch. He he picks up the Etch-A-Sketch, shakes it a little bit so it can mess up my design, and he begins to laugh. And here I was hurt crushed, heartbroken because what I had been working on had found itself erased in my memory, erased in front of me. And I believe that as we, before we even get to the text, that when you understand the real task of white supremacy, the main task of white supremacy is not simply uh, to put you on the back of the bus or to make you eat uh, at segregated lunch counters, but the reality of white supremacy is to cause you to lose sacred memory because when you have sacred memory, Sacred memory allows for you to imagine and dream of a life beyond the life that you have. And so as we jaywalk into our text in Luke chapter 23, we find a very evidence of this same fact that the Bible says that one of the criminals who were hanged uh, blasphemed. But so apparently there were some other folk near Jesus and they were labeled as criminals. But those of us who understand scripture understands that uh, the wrong Roman Empire and their sadistic forms of capital punishment always had uh, uh, methods that match the violation. And so regular criminals and regular thieves would not find themselves on the cross. They would typically have a hand cut off or there would be other forms of execution. But thieves would not end up on the cross because the cross was simply for revolutionaries. And somewhere in our prison industrial complex hermeneutic, when we've looked at this text, we've only been able to criminalize people that God had actually revolutionized. I really wish I could 
get a church right along here. And the reality of it is the reason why our young people do not see a life outside of what society tells them they ought to be is because we have dis- we have separated people from the history of ourselves that we are not just criminals, that we are not just gangbangers, that we are not just what they say that we are, but we are indeed the descendants of royalty, the first mathematicians, the first scientists, the first philosophers are in our bloodline. And for some reason, white supremacy is so intent on making its insecurity seem like it's the majority. But the reality of it is that you don't understand the enemy benefits from you not knowing who you are, from you not knowing where you came from, from you not knowing your true identity. And it's best explained in this book by uh, Ngugi Wa Thiongo, who is an African novelist, and he wrote a book called Something Torn and New. And in this book, he's talking about the importance of being an African author, but writing in his own language instead of succumbing to the pressures of writing in English or French or German. And he makes this statement. He says that when the oppressed speak in their native tongue, it is as if the dead rise up and begin to speak. Do you want to understand why the enemy is so mad at you and the enemy is trying to get under your skin because you are finally starting to get to the place when you remember who you are when you remember that you're more than what other people have said about you that you're more than what other people have thought about you and because of that the moment that you wake up to recognize who you are and you find yourself in a situation that you did not create the reality I said it in my prayer that no matter what situation you find yourself we serve an omnipresent God and so when you find yourself on the cross just know that you you next to Jesus and watch what he says to Jesus he says Jesus I don't want a new house I don't want a new car but all I need you to do is remember me when you come into your kingdom can I give you give you a little etymology and I'm out your way what you understand is remember remember means to put back together something that was separated something that was torn apart and so in this moment He is not simply asking to be a part of Jesus's sacred memory, but his request is, Lord, life has torn me a new one. Life has broken me down and taken me out. And if there's anything you can do with the last bit of breath in my lungs, can you just put me back together? And I just want to know, is there anybody here that can testify that what God did for you wasn't just in your credit? report. What God did for you wasn't just in the doctor's appointment but in the midnight hour God came in and put you back together. Come on, look at your neighbor one time and say I know life might have torn you something but you can be something torn and new because the Bible says that any man any woman that's in Christ is a new creature. The old thing have passed away and behold all things have become new I've got to leave you now I've held you too long may the Lord God bless you real real good but on my way down to my seat I know you're wondering what happened with that etch sketch I was sitting on the floor I was dejected I was hurt I was heartbroken because all I had been working on had been destroyed by my brother and I didn't know what was going to happen but if you remember the scene I painted that everybody was in the room my mama was in the room my brothers were in the room my sister was in the room but my father was standing right over my shoulder and I said daddy I don't understand why you would give me this toy if it would be destroyed like that but my father told me don't worry because I was looking over your shoulder the whole time I saw what the enemy did and I was looking over your shoulder at the same time and so don't even worry because at the end of the day 
you forgot before I was a preacher I was an engineer and even though you were trying to build a house I can build that house better than you can build it I've got to leave you now but in my father's house there are many mansions somebody that knows that God has put you back together say yes say yes say yes say saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby he said to her woman here is your son and to the disciple here is your mother from that time on the disciple took her into his home I'm gonna preach for the few minutes that I have as the Spirit of God shall God with this thought in our minds saving the best for last on May 25th, 2020, a 46-year-old man named by George Perry Floyd Jr. was handcuffed. He was pinned to the ground under the knee of former officer Derek Chauvin for nine minutes and 29 seconds. Derek Chauvin knew our oh, knee was on George Floyd's neck because of this horrific and inhumane act George Floyd died due to asphyxiation. He died all because a store clerk had a suspicion that he used a counterfeit $20 bill. What was striking to me, my brothers and my sisters, were his final words. As he was going through excruciating pain and barely able to breathe right before he died, with all that he had, he yelled out, Mama, Mama, Mama. And what's even more shocking is that even though he was calling out for his mother, she wasn't alive. The very next month on June 27th, an 18 year old entrepreneur by the name of Jelani Pless was selling waters on the street corners to provide money for his siblings and his mother. He got into an argument with another teenager over selling waters in the wrong area. In other words, they were having what they call a turf war over selling waters. The young man who approached this 18-year-old Jelani was upset, and because he was upset, he left because he was selling waters on the wrong turf. The young man was so upset, he grabbed a gun and shot and killed Jelani. Now, what's mind-boggling about this, while George Floyd, watch this, died because of $20, Jelani died over $10. And to my surprise, Jelani's last words before he was gunned down were, Mama? 
I feel like something is not right. January 10th, 2020, 29 year old FedEx worker by the name of Tyree Nichols. He was beaten by Memphis police officers for approximately three minutes. He was stopped for allegedly reckless driving. The stop led to a violent confrontation where the officers chased Tyree. The officers tased Tyree. The officers dragged Tyree. The officers pepper sprayed Tyree. The officers repeatedly punched and kicked Tyree with fists and baton. Because of those injuries, Tyree was hospitalized and died three days later. But what was striking to me as well as the others, his last words were, mom, mom, mom. And ladies and gentlemen, I need to tell you the reason more often why men will cry out to their mother is not because they are the favorite parent. It's not because they hate their fathers, but it's because we have a deeper connectivity to our mothers even before conception. For nine months, your mother nurtured you. For nine months, she fed you. For nine months, she restricted and restrained herself from the pleasures of life so that you would be healthy. And when you were born, she held you. When you cried, she cradled you. There's nothing like a mother's love. And as we come in contact with our text, we find Jesus, Mother, Mother Mary, near the cross with Mary Magdalene, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and John, the disciple. They were a Accompanied by a crowd of people on the hill called Golgotha. Now, what you need to know is that this hill called Golgotha, uh, there was dents in the face of the rocks that made it look like skull. So, as they're on this hill called Golgotha, although Jesus is the main attraction, although Jesus is being crucified, and year after year we emphasize his pain, year after year we illustrate his sufferings and we speculate on how Jesus may have felt. The relevant question this morning I have to you, my friends, is uh, this morning, what about Mary? Uh, how dare we neglect the pain and the suffering and the feelings that Mary had? I know Jesus is being crucified, but may I suggest to you, isn't Mary also being crucified? Uh, when Jesus was being betrayed and beaten, isn't Mary also being betrayed and beaten? And as a matter of fact, in the interview with Tyree Nichols' mother, she said at the time that he was being beaten, at the time that he was being abuse was at the very time simultaneously that her stomach was hurting. Uh, she couldn't understand why but now she understands the reason why she was in pain is because her son was in pain. Uh, can you imagine being at the front and center to witness uh, this crucifixion of your oldest child and there's nothing that you can do? Uh, can you imagine uh, being at the cross uh, at the cross and seeing the mother and seeing how she would be economically after his death because many scholars suggest that at this time Joseph is now deceased and if the father died back in those days the eldest son had to step up and be the provider so the Bible says that when Jesus saw his mother and the John disciple whom he loved even with the crowd he was able to locate where they were now, this is quite fascinating because not only was there Mary, Jesus' mother, not only was this Mary Magdalene, not only was this Mary, the wife of Clopas, not only was this John, his disciple, but there were also centurions. There were also chief priests. There were also bystanders looking onward. So there was a crowd and there were close proximity to the cross. But Jesus was still able to locate them in the crowd. And I'm here to encourage somebody that it feels uh, uh, like you may be getting lost in the crowd. God has not forgotten you. I know that you're in pain. I know that you're in struggle. I know that you're in trial. I know that you're in tribulation, but God has not forgotten you. He has the ability even amongst the crowd to locate you right where you are. 
Uh, so Mary, after he locates Mary and John, Jesus says, woman, uh, uh, which is gunai in Greek, uh, uh, look at John because uh, this is now your son. And tells John, uh, this is now your mother. And I believe that Jesus did this uh, in this fashion because uh, he wanted this to be his final blessing. Uh, he has accomplished everything that he needed and accomplished everything until this very moment. John uh, uh, chapter 2 he turned water and wine. Uh, in John chapter 4, he healed the son at Capernaum. Mm -hmm. In John chapter 5, he heals the invalid at Bethesda. In John chapter 6, he feeds the 5,000 with a loaf of bread. In John chapter 6, he walks on water. In John chapter 9, he heals the blind man. In John chapter 11, he raises Lazarus to dead, from dead. Uh, and if we skip to John chapter 19, his final blessing, watch this uh, was to relinquish his sonship uh, and place it on John uh, so that Mary could be taken care of. Uh, is there anybody this morning in the house uh, that can stand and testify and although you are in pain, uh, although you are grieving, uh, you have not been forgotten by God uh, because what he wanted to do uh, is save his best uh, for last. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, uh, he saved his good work uh, uh, for last. Uh, you have not been forgotten. God has you in the palm of your hands. Uh, God wants me to let you know, uh, stay in the crowd uh, because he's going to find you. Stay in the crowd uh, because he's going to locate you. Uh, stay in position uh, because he's going to find you at your very need. Uh, he's saving the best for last. Uh, is there anybody under the sound of my voice uh, that can wait their hand and say thank God huh, for saving your best huh, for last huh, and because you saved your best for last huh, I can feel the Lord huh, working on my behalf huh, I can feel the Lord huh, moving in my life huh, I can feel the Lord huh, transforming things huh, in my life huh, God told me to let you know huh, that he's saving his best huh, for last give him glory moment and ready ourselves for the fourth utterance hear these words that are recorded in the book of Matthew the 27th chapter it reads as thus at noon darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock at about three o'clock Jesus called out with a loud voice Eli Eli Lima Shabbatani which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Pray with me and for me. God, speak to me. Speak through me. And most importantly, speak in spite of me. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. For the time this mind, I want to use as a topic for sermonic discourse, invisible, but always accessible. By the time the fourth word was uttered from Calvary's cross, uh, creation was right smack in the middle of what had already been a peculiar day. Uh, the divine deliverer of our souls had already been betrayed by his brothers, beaten by barbarians, berated by band wagoneers due to feelings of inferiority by the religious ruling class uh, and the ignorance by the political elite in the hours uh, that had proceeded. Uh, scripture tells us that at 12 noon when the sun sun from the atmospheric point of view would normally be at its highest point providing light and warmth over the land it had shut down diplomatic negotiations with the so-called powers that be because the son of man had been humanly limited in his ability to shine bright but remain supernaturally committed to complete his assignment it was at this moment when darkness covered the entire earth, causing Jesus and all who stood by to bear witness to his public lynching and endure a three hour agonizing period of being unable to see much of anything, but feel a whole lot of everything. Here, this suffering savior who sought not to sabotage God's plan, only to signal the severity of the turmoil he was dealing with internally as well as externally spoke the words that undoubtedly broke his father's heart but still did not move him to break the fourth wall and say my son you don't have to go through with this plan no Jesus painstakingly opens his mouth declaring the sentiment that all of us who have peered into this text countless times feel when we read it and feel when we live it my God my God why have you forsaken me it is this statement and question being lifted at the same time for me by those of us whom life has life on to the utmost anybody had life life on them to the utmost uh, it's the only thing that we can think and it, because it appears that our reality is that God has turned the lights out on us and we remain paralyzed because of the nails of fear that have our backs against the cross of our condition. Anybody ever felt like God has turned the lights out on you in your marriage, in your money, in your ministry? And the longer the lights are off, the messier things seem to get. Anybody ever had the lights turned out on them? You see, as a child growing up, uh, I, Bishop Harvin, I was definitely afraid uh, of the dark. Uh, and while I must confess, uh, it is not my favorite place to be. Uh, it is something that I have developed uh, a certain level of familiarity with over the course of my life. Uh, uh, when my mother would place me in my bed at night as a little boy, I was good until she turned them lights out. Uh, then I would have myself a whole fit. Uh, I would start by talking to myself, uh, try to calm me down. Uh, but that would just be uh, enough uh, for a few seconds. I would begin to hear noises that weren't in the atmosphere before the lights were out. I began to see some things uh, that weren't in the room before the lights were out. All I could do was pull the cover up over my head uh, and just pray uh, that whatever was there wouldn't get me. I'd start to whisper, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. And if she didn't respond right away, I would use the little bit of courage I had left to make my way into her room. But all oh, the nights in which my father was not working late, I knew I could not get in the room. I would call for my mother, and if she didn't answer right away, I would hear a voice that was a little bit deeper. It would say, yes. I would say, Daddy, I want to 
to come uh, uh, in the room with you. And my father would say, no, son, uh, you got to stay in there where you are because that's the only way uh, uh, you're going to learn how to be a big boy. Uh, that's the only way you're going to learn uh, how to deal with uh, the dark uh, of your life. Uh, I, I said, daddy, I don't want to. He says, son, I know you don't want to, but sometimes you got to do the things that you don't want to do in life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever been in a place where you had to do some things that you really didn't want to? But God said, if you stay there, it'll develop you and elevate you to a place and space where I can use you to get the glory out of your life. Here it is. My father would say to me, he'd say, son, if you just, uh, just, 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 just go on and close your eyes and go to sleep, I'm going to let you know, ain't nothing going to happen to you. Uh, and nobody's going to come and get you. Ain't nobody going to do nothing to you. I said, daddy, how, how, how do you, how do you know that? He says, son, because I'm only in the other room. <laughs> Can I talk to somebody? When Jesus uttered the fourth word, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It seemed as if God had abandoned him. It seemed as if God had left him. He was only in the other room. Ah, some theologians might say he was in the upper room. Ah, he was invisible, but he was always accessible. Anybody know God to be always invisible? Ah, but always accessible. I came to let you know just because you can't see him doesn't mean he's not there. It may seem like he's invisible, but he's always accessible. That's why I kept calling my father as a little boy, and that's why I call my father as a fully grown man, because I need to let him know I need thee every hour. I need thee. God, come and bless me. I'm going to my seats. Pastor, sometimes God makes you have to live the word before you preach the word. Yesterday, somewhere around about five o'clock, I got a pain in the side of me that I ain't never felt before. I called my brother Michael. I said, you got to pray. You got to pray right now. I don't know what this is. I don't got time for this. I got four services tomorrow. I got to get through this. And I said, press your way on. I made my way on to the patient first. I didn't know what they were going to say. They came in the room. They came out of the room. They came in the room. They came out of the room. They took blood. They took x-rays. And they said, son, you got kidney stones. I said, how in the world I'm going to deal with kidney stones when I got to be at Penn Ave at 9 and my church at 11 and all these places. And I laid there on that bed and the pain kept coming and the pain kept coming. And I cried out in that patient first room, my God. And right there in that moment. Before I even got to the second, my God, he reminded me uh, he may be invisible, but he's always accessible. And I thank God today uh, that he is right with me and I may not have what I want, but I thank God he's given me everything I need. Invisible, but always accessible in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Thank you, my Lord. God bless you. Come on and give God glory for what he's doing here this morning is anybody being blessed by the word come on and give god praise if the lord is blessing you today amen and give god praise for these first four preachers that have blessed us come on give him glory for the word of god being broken the bread of life being broken here today amen it is time for us to continue worshiping god through our giving on today we want to encourage you to do your very best in this morning's offering 
amen we don't we're not going to offer a standard but we would like for you to give as god has given unto you be generous trust god bless him amen you know how good god has been hasn't he been keeping you through inflation and a difficult economy and all kinds of challenges in our lives but god keeps on making a way amen so we want you to sow into our ministry and into the kingdom of god this morning uh, as you will as you're preparing to give we would also invite you and encourage you uh, that in your pews you will find a connection card a, a prayer request card and if you have either one of those things either a prayer request or even if you would like to and if you might feel uh, moved and we would appreciate it if you would to share a little information about yourself that we might follow up with you and include you in our database so that we can send you information and keep you posted on what's happening here on the avenue and even if you're looking for a church home or a place to connect with or a fellowship to join uh, we'd love for you to even express that on that connection card and when you come bring your offering you can place that in the offering baskets as well as you return to your seats and so with those words we're going to offer a word of prayer amen uh, as you want to if you want to give on your digital uh, phone on your smartphones on any platform you can use the givelify application which many of us may be familiar with you'll search pennsylvania avenue amy zion church our logo will appear and you can give very securely there or you can use our cash app which is pen app a m e z c pen av a m e z c one word give that uh you can give through that way as well if you're watching online you can use your uh, our give our website our, there is a give tab on pen av a m e z i n dot church and on that giving tab you can press that and it will prompt you uh, on how you can give through our website or you can use the good old-fashioned way use those giving envelopes in your uh, pews or you can just offer it however you see fit nevertheless those are instructions for our giving on the day don't forget your connection cards and prayer requests put those in the baskets along with your offering come on let's pray god we love you and thank you for the privilege that you've offered us which is to give back unto you lord god it's when we're giving that we're most like you because god you mo you gave your only begotten son lord god and so let us give as you have given unto this entire world so into the kingdom which you first blessed us with and as we give back to you with just a portion of how richly you blessed our lives and so god bless now this offering consecrate it set it aside for the work of the kingdom we love you and thank you for every gift and giver it's in jesus name that we pray and god's people together said amen please stand to your feet follow the direction of the ushers and bring your very best offering to the lord as the choir blesses us with another selection
Does somebody know that the blood still works? Come on, does somebody know that the blood still works? Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. For the time that Zosh want to preach from this thought, the thirst is real. Lord, do it again in Jesus' name. Amen. The thirst is real has been shown as a meme that has been circulating throughout social media platforms. According to the Ur Urban Dictionary, to be thirsty means to be desperate or too eager to get something. And I would suggest this morning that the thirst is real out here in these streets. Because many are thirsty for power, position, and prestige. Many are thirsty for attention, acceptance, and a boo. Many are thirsty for quick fixes, quick moves, and quick promotions. And on the other hand, some are thirsty for reconciliation, forgiveness, and healthy connections. Some are thirsty for authentic love. Some are thirsty for something new and something fresh. Some are thirsty for something that is unorthodox and, and out of the box. Some are thirsty for what's next and the endless possibilities connected to it. Others are thirsty 
thirsty for something that they just can't even name. They just cannot even explain it. All I know this morning is that the thirst uh, is real. And, and the question that we must ask ourselves is this. Uh, what am I thirsty for? Uh, as we examine the context and the energy surrounding our text, uh, the thirst was real for Jesus too at this moment uh, on the cross. Uh, we, we find Jesus on the cross hanging in a position of self-suffocation. Uh, and, and the only relief possible from the physical pressure upon his lungs is to hoist his weight upon his nail scarred wrist and his nail scarred feet and as the hours passed he was crucified in the burning heat of the noonday sun which is extremely hot and this action of hoisting your weight upon your feet and your wrists would become more and more difficult and increasingly painful for Jesus see the Romans desired designed it this way uh, for this very purpose uh, they wanted to make it hard for Jesus uh, this was intentional uh, this was planned the cross was a means to inflict the most severe amount of pain uh, possible uh, and I would suggest that Jesus was not only physically in pain uh, but mentally he was in pain socially he was in pain emotionally he was in pain and even at times spiritually he was experiencing pain this was an extremely traumatic experience for Jesus this was an extremely weighty moment for him being lynched on the cross it is out of this place of exhaustion that Jesus declares that the thirst is real yeah the hours spent in the sun coupled with the pain that he was feeling created mild if not severe dehydration his body did not have enough water to carry out normal tasks so Jesus speaks of his own thirst out of a real human need for sustenance and relief on the cross Jesus is physically thirsty and he knew Knew that his death was imminent. Uh, Jesus knew that everything that he had experienced uh, was connected to what God had willed. Uh, so when Jesus cries out, I am thirsty, uh, it speaks to what has already been spoken uh, in Psalm 69 and 12 B, uh, which says, and for my thirst, uh, they gave me vinegar to drink. Uh, so they gave Jesus cheap wine, uh, which was a favorite of those in the lower ranks of society. And this sour wine was to contract the throat muscles and to keep Jesus from shrieking in pain. But we should look at this as an act of compassion because what they did would ultimately prolong his pain, which would continue what Jesus had was already experiencing. So he refused the cup of relief previously offered and he drank the cup of suffering to fulfill the will of the father oh but the greater message here in this text is this that Jesus experienced the thirst of humanity on that cross Jesus felt the unique thirst of every human heart who longs to be satisfied and I come all the way here from New Britain to declare unto us this morning that Jesus still thirsts for us in that good news this morning that he still thirsts for us he thirsts for our sin he thirsts for our brokenness he thirsts for our misery he thirsts for our guilt and our shame he thirsts for our humanity he thirsts for what we want to become he thirsts for our transformation and our salvation. He thirsts for our destiny. 
glory and our purpose. He thirsts for us. He desires us. He's concerned about us. So since Jesus thirsts for us, we must thirst for him. We must search for him in a dry and barren land. We must long for his hand of guidance. We must position ourselves so he can cleanse us with his reign so he can baptize us once again. Now is the time to thirst for Jesus like he thirsts for us. I come to let you know that the thirst is real. So fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven. Bread of heaven. Feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup and make me whole. Fill my cup and save me. Fill my cup and protect me. Fill my cup and deliver me. Fill it up and set me free. Fill it up and keep me. And I don't know about you, but I came this morning to get to the filling station. I came expecting a refill. I want a refill. I need a refill. Is there anybody here who needs a refill? Somebody shout yeah. Somebody shout yeah. Shout yeah. Because the thirst is real. So come Lord Jesus. Fill me up. Come Lord Jesus. Fill me up. Come Lord Jesus. And fill me up. And make me whole. The thirst is real.
Would you just elbow somebody and say it won't lose its power? Elbow somebody on the other side and say never. Never, 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 never. shout never. The gospel according to St. John chapter 19. Beginning at verse 28. Later knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Father, I pray. Preach us silly in Jesus' name. Amen. Picture it. July 2016. Boarding a flight with about 30 young people headed to Memphis for the Connectional Youth Young Adult Conference of the CME Church. A good portion of the group had never flown, so the anxiety was high. We make it through the takeoff, we get in the air, and the captain comes over the speaker and announces we'll have to keep our seatbelts on a little while longer because there were some turbulent conditions ahead. A few bumps and dips in and you could see tears flowing and you could hear the gasp and the grunts and eventual shrieks of those who had no idea that the air had worse potholes than the highway to nowhere just down the street. (laughs) The plane shook, bounced, dipped, and at times noticeably sped up. For about 20 minutes, the turbulence persisted. Eventually, the pilot turned off the seatbelt sign and assured us that we were now on the other side of the worst of the storm. One of the little girls loudly exclaimed, I'm glad that's over. If you would indulge me just for the next few moments, that's my message title. I'm glad that's over. My beloved brothers and sisters, when it is that we look at this portion of scripture, we discover that our Savior has been given the sour wine. And according to the text, after he has received it, Jesus opens his mouth one more time and makes a declaration. Jesus declares, it is finished. According to the word of God, we discover that he really only says one word to tell us that. And it is when he says this word that he pronounces that what he has been going through has now come to an end. Might I submit to you today, my beloved brothers and sisters, that the bitter part is now over. Uh, Perhaps you came to this worship encounter this morning uh, and you've been dealing with the grief and the shame of some of the stuff that you've endured. I've come just to prophetically declare over your life uh, that God says it's over. Is there anybody in this building that has ever been in a space and a place in your life uh, where you realize that the only reason you made it uh, was because God was on your side. Uh, Here it is that Jesus has now done the work he has done the work of committing the care of those who are around the cross to the forgiveness of the father he has done the work of ensuring that a man on the cross was redeemed and has a seat in paradise he is reminded that even in this 
moment he still owes it to his mother to make sure that she's good when he's gone and the Bible says that after this drink the Bible declares unto us that he says it's finished my beloved brothers and sisters might I submit to you that even in this very moment your present is now your past Some of us in the building owe God a great amount of praise and thanks simply because I made it to the other side of that. Perhaps it was abandonment. Perhaps it was rejection. Perhaps uh, it was the frustration of feeling forsaken. Perhaps uh, it was relational grief. Perhaps uh, it was fleshly anguish. But whatever it was, I want to let somebody know today uh, that you've made it to the other side of that. Uh, and I want to encourage you that it's absolutely okay uh, to acknowledge what you survived. Uh, Jesus says it is finished. Uh, and here's what I like about this portion of the text is Jesus does not say I am finished but rather he says it is finished and I want to tell somebody uh, that this is the perfect opportunity uh, for you to open up your mouth uh, and declare that some stuff uh, is finished done settled and over is there anybody in this sanctuary uh, that's ever been in a place in your life uh, where you had to declare in your home on your job in that relationship Relationship at school, wherever you were, you had to declare it's finished. I want to tell somebody today uh, that this is a season and an opportunity uh, for you to use your prophetic authority uh, and declare it's over. I want to tell somebody today uh, that this is a moment uh, where you must acknowledge uh, that your bitter season is over. You did what you were supposed to do. Uh, you gave what you were supposed to give. Uh, you served when you were supposed to serve and the worst is over is there anybody in this building that will wave your hand at me and say the worst is over I'm done <laughs> watch watch the order of the text Parker because Jesus is on the cross and he says, it is finished. But the text doesn't end there. It says, then he gave up the ghost. Some translations would have us to understand that it, that portion of scripture means that he breathed his last. And I want to tell somebody today that you need to take note of how all of this transpires in the scripture. God have mercy. Uh, the Bible says that after he drank from the cup, he says it is finished. And then he gave up the ghost. In other words, what some of us need to understand is that the vessel outlived the assignment. I want you to understand that perhaps it was ordained to kill you. Perhaps it was ordained to lead you to your demise. But I want you to, to declare over your own life, I'm going to outlive this. It may have been bitter. You may have been bruised. You may have been battered and scorned. But I want to tell somebody uh, that this is a season uh, where God's about to allow you uh, to outlive what you've been going through uh, and after you've suffered a little while uh, then you shall come forth. Uh, I need somebody to be encouraged uh, that perhaps you've been struggling uh, for a very long time uh, but even though uh, it's been bitter in your life uh, I want to tell somebody uh, that it's going to be out of your mouth uh, that's going to declare that it's over it's going to be out of your mouth that will declare when the season is time to change it will be out of your mouth and watch this and I promise I'm out of your way but when the text closes it says he breathes his last in other words even after he declares it's finished he breathes again and can I 
tell somebody uh, that this is a season uh, where God is using you uh, and he wants to let you know uh, that you have time uh, to take another breath uh, after you've endured uh, all the hell you went through uh, it's time uh, to take another breath uh, is there anybody here uh, that will open up your mouth uh, and declare uh, I'm glad uh, that it's over uh, and I can stand uh, like the old preacher uh, and declare uh, for as much uh, as it has pleased uh, almighty God uh, who in his wise providence uh, took out of this world uh, unto himself uh, my issues uh, my failures uh, my flaws uh, now uh, we declare earth to earth uh, ashes to ashes uh, and dust to dust uh, because what I went through uh, is over uh, and my next shout uh, is because I made it uh, is there anybody here uh, that will wave your hand at me uh, and say I will rejoice uh, because I made it through uh, I will give them glory uh, because I survived it uh, I will give them praise uh, because it may be over but God's not through uh, with me yet somebody open up your mouth uh, and shout I'm glad that it's over I'm glad that it's over I'm glad
pray with me, won't you? God, if you're still talking, we're still listening. In Jesus' name we pray. And together the people of God said amen and amen. Luke chapter 23, Luke chapter 23, beginning at verse number 44. And the word of God says, it was now about the sixth hour. And there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. The word of God is already blessed. I'm going to preach for just a couple minutes from the thought, this one is personal. This one is personal. When we examine Jesus' journey toward death, we see that it has not been easy. Uh, from the dinner table to the garden to the jail cell to the courtyard to the journey up the mount, Jesus has struggled. He has exhausted his physical strength. He has lost the function of his extremities, functions many of us far too often take for granted. He has felt the pain of sharp thorns penetrating his skull. He has endured the paralyzing sting of whips along his flesh, the crippling heat of the sun as it elevated the temperature of his exposed body until the moment that same sun refused to shine. Enduring what happened on Calvary was not easy. It was not easy being beaten and battered to the point that you are unrecognizable even to those that love you most. It was not easy to climb Galgotha's hill with the weight of a tree crushing on your spine. It was not easy to deal with the pain of nails being driven through his hands and feet. It was not easy to listen to the harsh words nor be subjected to the judgmental looks of relentless onlookers and downright nosy church folk, many of whom just five days prior were singing and shouting his praises in the streets of Jerusalem. And it certainly uh, was not easy to endure the very life being drained from his body. It was not easy. Mm. But beloved, it was necessary. Mm. It was necessary because without what Jesus went through, There'd be no hope for folks like you and me. Six times already he's cried out. He's forgiven his enemies. He's offered mercy to a booster. He's put in place a care plan for his mama. He has wrestled with paternal abandonment issues. He has exposed and expressed physical thirst. He has triumphantly declared that the assignment has been completed. And now, in one final conversation from the cross with his daddy, Jesus expressed absolute trust in his father by willingly placing his spirit mm -hmm, the essence of who and what he is in his father's hands now granted uh, granted the Roman officials and the religious leaders of Jesus's day thought that they were the masterminds and original architects of this horrific moment in the story of humanity. But the reality is all of this mm -hmm, has been orchestrated by a name far more powerful than any of the names that signed off on this execution order. And this last cry from our Savior on the cross teaches us two lessons that we can't afford to miss. First lesson, there there's never a time that we can't call on the Father. Mm -hmm. We know where he is. Jesus is in a bad situation. Mm. He's been wrongfully and illegally tried and found guilty of crimes for which they had no proof he has ever committed. 
He has been sentenced to death by crucifixion and the sentence is actively being carried out. But even in this, thank you, Holy Ghost, Jesus knows that he can call on his daddy. In fact, this isn't the first time he calls his father when he cries out from the cross for the first time. He's talking to his daddy. And now here at the last cry, he's talking to his daddy. Child of God, might I surmise to you that you you can't go wrong talking to your daddy. Mm -hmm. Talking with your father or mess around and get your mind and your body healed. Talking to your father will mess around and get your family restored. Talking to your father will mess around and get your bills paid from unexpected resources. Talking to God will mess around and get your relationship stronger. Talking to God will grow your ministry more than any sermon you can ever preach. Child of God, there are benefits of to talking to God and I don't know whose testimony this is in the room other than me but I'm glad about it because there's been some stuff that if I could not have talked to God about it I would have lost my mind if I could not have talked to God about it I might have ended up down in the bookings if I could not have talked to God about it somebody might have caught hands I'm glad Glad I can, I can talk to, talk to my father. So y'all sit down. We just talking. So, so first lesson we need to know is there's never a time uh, when we can't talk to the father. Uh, but the second lesson this text teaches us is that God's hands are big enough for whatever we put in them. Mm -hmm. uh, not only, watch this. Not only, not only does Jesus call out to his father uh, in a bad situation. But he puts in his father's hands what is most important to him. Mm -hmm. He gives God his spirit, his ruah. Mm -hmm. He places in God's hands the essence of who he is. Uh, in other words, he says, uh, Daddy, I have exhausted uh, this human body to the full of its purpose for being created. Mm -hmm. They can have this body, but into your hands and your hands only, I place who I am. Ah, ah, beloved! How, how might your life change if you put in God's hands the stuff that's really too big for yours? Mm -hmm. How might things turn around if you took your hands off of some stuff and let God put his hands on it? Child of God, there are some things in your life that, trust me, you want God to have his hands on. And I wonder if there's anybody in the room online that can say, preacher, I'm so glad I put some stuff in his hands because ever since I put it in his hands, stuff has been better. When I put my mind in his hands, he started keeping it in perfect peace. When I put my body in his hands, he healed me from what the doctor said I would die from. When I put my children in his hands, they started acting like they finally had some sense. Beloved, I know you think that you can handle it all and that God is too busy taking care of your neighbor's stuff that he ain't got time for you and yours. But child of God, I came up Pennsylvania Avenue just to let somebody know that God's hands are big enough for your stuff and your neighbor's stuff and your neighbor's neighbor's stuff and your neighbor's neighbor's neighbor stuff and thanks be to God that God can handle everything that we can't thanks be to God that when it becomes too much for our hands his hands are right there to take it on and I don't know about you but I thank God that with all he has to hold on to he's never dropped me nor my stuff he's never mishandled what is important to me in fact do me a favor high five your neighbor and tell your neighbor the only reason I'm 
still here today is because God's never dropped me. The only reason I'm still here today is because God has never mishandled my stuff. The only reason I'm still here today is because God knew how to take care of what I needed to give him. And this ain't for everybody in the room, but for about five or 15 of us, we need to let our neighbors know, excuse me, but this one is personal. After all I've been through, this one is personal. After the tears I cried and the nights I could not sleep, this one is personal. After the fights I had to fight and the mess I had to clean up, this one is personal. After the whips and the nails, this one is personal. After the crown and the sponge, this one is personal. And since blessings still fall when praises go up, this one is personal. I will bless the Lord at all times and this praise shall continually be in my mouth. Have a great day, Penab. May the Lord God bless you real good. But high five your neighbor as I go to my seat and let your neighbor know this one and bless the Lord what a what a what a service aren't you glad you came to Pennsylvania Avenue this morning didn't you start your day off right it's a good Friday isn't it come on and give God praise if you know it's a good Friday come on and give him glory stand on your feet we're about to leave this place but I just need the whole house praise God if you know he he blessed you this morning. You, somebody heard something that you needed to hear. Somebody got something in your spirit that blessed you. Come on and give a praise. Sing quiet. This congregation, everybody, we know this. Sing it.
out this morning. Come on and give God praise to all these preachers. All of these wonderful men of God. A couple of which had to leave, but most are still intact. Pray for their churches. All pastors, young men. So many attacks. So many obstacles. So many challenges. They go into leading a congregation. So pray for them. Keep them in your prayers. Call their names. Uh, as you look at your programs, if you want to follow up with further knowledge about them and their churches, they're all on social media, I'm sure. So just search their names and you'll get greater insights into their ministries. But thank you, gentlemen, for being with us today and letting the Lord use you. Amen. We thank God for you, your families. Amen. Your significant others. We thank God for all of you who are here today. We want to thank our musician, Brother Tavon Booz and brother brandon on the percussion over there come on and give god praise for this choir amen praise the lord sister jalayla led directed the choir this morning amen come on say amen to these ushers who served all morning long our greeters and hostess and now give yourselves a hand for coming out early to this good friday service again there are refreshments and a continental breakfast prepared for you before you leave so uh, we would love for you to partake of that amen and we do pray that you will enjoy the rest of your day let us receive now a closing prayer blessing and benediction god we love you and thank you for this time together lord it is so meaningful for us who call ourselves believers and christians to spend time remembering what you did for us on the cross God, we talk about the blessings. We talk about your favor. We talk about your love and kindness, God. But it is so important for us to always reflect on the depth of that love, the source of our hope, the greatness of our joy that is found in what you did for us, oh God, on the cross. God, let us always draw near and never forget your sacrifice and your love for each and every one of us. We've never been loved more than we are right now, God. And so we thank you for all that you are in our lives and help us throughout this day and this entire holy week now heading towards easter and resurrection sunday lord let us hold you in our hearts and when we do come to that resurrection morning god let us give you a special praise and even greater glory god because these are awesome times and you're yet still alive and doing great things in our lives and so god we give you glory this morning we pray for these preachers that you will encourage strengthen them lord god for the rest of their daily assignments god pour back into them god what they expended here in declaring your word bless each and every one of us lord god that now as we leave this place but never your presence god you will guide us and lead us wherever we shall go god and we will be careful to give you all the glory honor and praise for all of the wonderful things that you continue to do in our lives god we give you glory honor and praise now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the glory of his presence with exceeding great joy to the only wise god our savior be glory and majesty dominion and power from henceforth now and forevermore and God's people say amen to the glory of God.